Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join this program today as we discuss God's Word. You know, one of the problems of man today is being willing to follow just what God says. We often think that the Bible is just a, not a command as such, but just some guidelines that we should follow. And then if you break it or do not follow exactly, then that's okay because after all, God is a God of love and kindness and forgiveness and compassion. So he doesn't really expect complete obedience. But I think it's significant that nothing is emphasized in the Bible more than the demand to respect and obey God's commands. Now, most Christian people give lip service to respecting God's commands, but obviously there's a great deal of difference in their beliefs. Well, what's the difference in the beliefs of Christian people? Well, there's many reasons, maybe. One reason is because some only give lip service to obeying God's will. In other words, they say they want to obey God, but they're not really willing to do it. <clears throat> they're willing to do it as long as it fits within their ideas and their wisdom. But, of course, that's not really obeying God. Other people believe that as long as you are sincere, then it doesn't really matter what you do. Sincerity is all that matters in their opinion. Now, it's good to be sincere. Indeed, we have to be sincere if we're ever going to be pleasing to God. But there's more to it than just being sincere. And we're going to look at this lesson today and see how that God expects more than just being sincere. All the way through God's Word, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find the emphasis on obeying God's will, upon doing just what He says. For example, in the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 4, we find the story of Cain and Abel. Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did for the very simple reason that Cain did not offer it according to the way God commanded. Abel offered a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and it was acceptable to God. Cain offered a sacrifice from the field, and it was not acceptable. And, of course, Cain found out that his sacrifice was not accepted by God, and he became very angry, not at God, but he became angry at Abel, so much so that he killed his brother Abel. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, talks about this episode when he says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he attained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. He said, by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Now we often discuss exactly what was wrong with Cain's sacrifice. Was it the wrong sacrifice, or was it the, done in the wrong way, or exactly what? Well, of course, the Bible doesn't really tell us why it was not accepted, and it doesn't really matter. Cain knew what he needed to do because Hebrew said it was done by faith. Now, you cannot do something by faith unless you know what you're supposed to be doing. So, obviously, Cain and Abel both knew what God had wanted, but for some reason, Cain felt like he did not have to do it just like God wanted and so, therefore, his sacrifice was not accepted. You see, Cain seemed to think that as long as you have faith, then it should be good enough. But it wasn't, was it? We come to Noah and the ark in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. There in those two chapters, we find that God told Noah to build an ark, 
And he gave him an exact blueprint of the ark, told him exactly how to build it, what to build it out of, and so forth. And it says in Genesis 7 and verse 5, Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And because Noah did exactly what God commanded, then of course he was saved from the flood that destroyed everyone else. Again, we see the emphasis upon doing just what God says. We come to Leviticus chapter 10. There we find two priests, Nadab and Abihu, offering a sacrifice to God. But it said that they offered a strange sacrifice in chapter 10 in verse 1. A strange fire, rather. Now, this strange fire was fire that came from an unauthorized source. God had told them exactly where to get the fire to consume the sacrifice. But apparently, they did not feel like it was necessary to be so strict. And so they got it from some other place. And, of course, it eventually fire consumed them and they were killed. They offered strange fire. You see, God, they offered fire which God had not commanded, and they were killed because of it. When God tells us what to do and how to do it, then that eliminates all else. Now, we would think that fire is fire, and what difference does it make exactly where you got it from? That's what we would think. Maybe that's what Nadab and Abihu thought. But obviously, that's not what God thought. According to God's idea, they were not respecting the word of God by not doing what he said. We find in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6, Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Apparently, Nabal and Abihu thought they could add something to God's word. And of course, they were rebuked because of it. Then we find a very innocent act, or at least it seems to us to be a very innocent act, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we find David moving the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel after it had been taken captive from uh, the Philistines. But he put it on a cart. Now God had commanded them to put it on the shoulders of the Levites. Nowhere does the Bible say that the ark could not be carried on a cart, but nevertheless, God said it should be carried on the shoulders of the Levites, and that ruled out everything else. David either did not know that, or he had forgotten it. Either way, he put it on a cart, and it was carrying it back home that way. Uzzah was walking along beside the cart. He was not a priest. And as the cart hit a bump in the road, then the ark began to sway and he thought the ark was going to fall off the cart and therefore probably would be destroyed. And so he innocently put his hand up to steady the ark. And he, when he touched the ark, immediately he was killed by God. Now to us, that sounds a very innocent mistake and a very cruel punishment for such a, an innocent mistake, wasn't it? Well, it may be that way to us, but again, that shows that God is serious about his commands. He wants us to obey him, and we cannot just use our personal opinions to change that. Us have violated a positive command of God. The command of God was that no one but the priest should be able to touch the ark. Us was not a priest, and he touched the ark anyway. He should have known the law. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Now, we don't know, but he should have known the law and not touched the ark. Now, I would say that Uzzah was probably honest and his heart was probably right. I mean, after all, I put myself in his position, and if I had been in Uzzah's place, undoubtedly, I would probably have done exactly the same thing. I would just by reflex put my arm up to steady the ark so that the ark would not have broken. Well, I'd probably been killed just like us as it was then. You see, it doesn't matter whether Uzza was honest or sincere. Like I said, he probably was. 
But nevertheless, he violated the plain command of God, and he was killed because of it. So therefore, how can one say that one can do as he pleases as long as a person is sincere? Uzzah, like I said, were most likely very sincere, and yet it was not enough. No, being sincere is not enough. We have to obey what God says. But then someone says, well, the Bible, we're going to have to do just what he says. When the Bible does not condemn something, then that means we should be able to do it. But we find an argument from silence based in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14. There the right of Hebrews said, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Now, in that context, the writer of Hebrews was talking about Jesus being the high priest. And Jesus, of course, was not from the tribe of Levi. Therefore, according to the law, he could not be a priest, certainly not a high priest. But yet Jesus was a high priest. So then how can Jesus be a high priest? Well, the law must be changed. The law must be taken away because according to the law, Jesus could not be a priest. And yet where in the law does it say that no, no one except the people from the tribe of Levi could be a priest? Well, it doesn't say no one else. It simply says priests were to come from the tribe of Levi. Nothing is said about not being coming from any other tribe only that the fact that it came from Levi. But when it specified that priests should come from the tribe of Levi, then obviously that ruled out all other tribes. You see, an argument from the silence of scriptures then is not just our idea, it's not just our tradition, but it is from God. When the Bible says nothing about something, then we need to be very careful because probably it's going to be wrong if we try to do it. But then someone might say, but all the examples you looked at so far, they're all in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, yes, God was very strict. But in the New Testament, God is not nearly as strict because now we're under grace. We're not under law anymore. Well, let's look at that idea for just a moment. In Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 2, we find the right of Hebrews saying that if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just reward. In other words, he's saying in the Old Testament, every transgression received a reward, that is, it was punished. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. If anyone who had rejected Moses' law died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Again, in these verses, we see the importance of obeying the law of Moses. Obey it just as it was written. Anyone who disobeyed Moses' law, they were justly punished. But then notice verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? This verse points out that in, in, as the, in the reverse of what we often think, you know, people often say, well, we're under grace, therefore we don't have to worry about obeying just what God says no more. But that verse says, if every transgression under the old law was punished, then how much worse punishment is it going to be for us when we count the blood of Christ and the commands of Christ as no unimportant? You see, rather than being less severe and less strict, if anything, God is now going to be more strict because we have more blessings. We know more about God. We have greater responsibility. Christ said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no means pass away. God's word is here. It is unchangeable, and we must obey it. Yes, in our society, there is a widespread attitude 
that God's word is not really binding and that it's not necessary to be strictly concerned about God's word as a law. So many would say that if it seems right and there's no command telling us not to do it, then surely we can do it. But again, Proverbs fourteen twelve said, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Indeed, it might seem that way to us, but that's not the way it is with God. Paul made a very strict statement, a very telling statement in Colossians 3 and verse 17. He said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. To do it in the name of Jesus means to do it by the authority of Jesus. So we simply need to ask, where is the authority for what I want to do in religion? It's not enough just to, just to simply say the Bible doesn't say I can't do it. Maybe it doesn't. But where does it say I should do it? That's the authority we're seeking after. And we need to rest assured and have to be satisfied with doing just what God says. That's what God requires. That's what God wants. No, we can't do it perfectly. And God is willing to forgive us when we don't do it perfectly. But nevertheless, we must have the attitude of trying to do just what God says. I hope that this will encourage you to be more strict concerning what God's word is. Bless you in your, as you try to serve God in your life. Thank you. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course, kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15. Arthur Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu For more details dial 9244204420 9244214421 God bless you The Church of Christ salutes you